Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 to 4. Chapter 4, verses 1 is what we are going to read. So let's read it together. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as it is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and don't be bitter towards them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they won't become discouraged. Slaves, obey your human masters in everything. Don't work only while being watched as people pleasers, but work wholeheartedly, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do it from your heart as something done for the Lord and not for people. Knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord, you serve the Lord Jesus. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong he has done, and there is no favoritism. Masters, deal with your slaves justly and fairly, since you know that you too have a master in heaven. Can we lift up our hands and just thank the Lord for his word? Amen. You all may be seated, please. Praise the Lord. Amen. I greet you all once again in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and uh, those who are in the sanctuary, those who are attending service online, I pray that today's service will be a blessing in your lives. And uh, God is sustaining us. His mercies are new every day. That's why we are here this morning. Amen. I always think like this. God has given us one more day and uh, he has given us another opportunity to serve him on the, this side of eternity that is in this world. And we have to utilize all those opportunities. Um, you know, when we were small and when we were children, you know, parents used to tell us, study. If you study well, you, you will have a good future. Um, you know, if you, if you study well and if you do what you're supposed to do in a good way, what is going to happen is, you know, when you grow up, you will get a good job and you will be able to take care of yourself and probably others too. So the reason I said that is because, you know, while we are in this world, God has given us this opportunity to do what we can do for him. And uh, then when we go into eternity, we'll be with him. Amen. This morning, I want to talk about relationships. The portion we have read talks about how should a Christian household or the members of Christian household should be? Last week we looked at uh, how should a Christian life be? Life of a, uh, a person with Christ, who's living with Christ. And today, number one, we want to, we all acknowledge that humans are made as relational beings. We relate to one another. Um, when I say that, what it means is, when God created us, he created us with this need for relationships. Just like we have need for food, air, water, and different things. And when we go for our medical checkups, when they do a full testing, they will tell you have this deficiency, you have that deficiency, then we will take tablets or we take medicines to... Um, you know, overcome the deficiencies we have because our body needs a lot of things. In the same way as humans, as people created in God's image, we need uh, what we call as relationships. We need the company of one another. And we relate to one another in many ways. We celebrate relationships. That's why people have made a lot of days, including today, which is, this day is Mother's Day. And uh, I was reading that uh, the person who started the Mother's Day or the day had a totally different idea than what is happening today. And they actually were not very happy with the commercialization of Mother's Day. But they were with a different uh, good intent. They started the Mother's Day. And then we have Father's Day, Grandparents' Day, Siblings' Day, Friends' Day, this day, that day. So there is a lot of days, which all points to the fact that as humans, we celebrate relationships. One of the biggest expenditure which an average person, especially in this country, not only in this country, in many places, you know, incur in their life is when they get married. Uh, the wedding expenses, the amount of money spent on that single day and for few hours. 
um, probably three to four hours is enough for that, uh, that couple to survive a couple of years. But uh, that's the amount of money which is spent many times for that, you know, uh, two, three years, uh, through two, three hours of ceremony and other things, you know, all the things associated with that. You know, some people spend a lot of money on those things because that's a day when they are entering into a relationship which is understood to be a lifelong relationship. Everyone who gets married actually enters into a relationship with that thought. Uh, you know, later things fall apart. That's a different story. But if somebody knew that they are going to fall apart later, they would not have gone and got married, right? Especially in today's world. So as humans, we uh, value relationships. We value friendships. You know, somebody um, did a study on all the people who had, um, you know, cardiac issues and they had a surgery and how long did they live after that and all those things. And they found out, not getting into the statistics of the study, but which came across my attention some time ago, is that people who had friends and who had good relationship and communication, you know, they lived longer uh, than people who didn't have anybody. So, you know, this, this is very important. Otherwise, there is a void in our lives. When we talk about friendship, it says there are a few things I want to remind about friendship just before I start with this message. It says, a friend is one who overlooks your broken fence and admires the flowers in your garden. Many people will walk in and out of your life, but only true friends will leave footprints in your heart. And then relationships are important to us because we are called to love, respect each other as individuals and society. And Bible actually t has a lot of things to say about human relationships. We are going to look at six types of relationships today. And they are presented in a set of, or a pairs. So we have three sets of relationships from the scripture portion we have read today. And as I said, this portion has to deal with families and relationships, Christian relationships. And we all play these roles in our life. Recently, I, I heard somebody who wrote a book about different relationships based on the personal experience. How to be a daughter, how to be a wife, how to be a daughter-in-law, how to be a mother, and uh, different uh, roles they have played in their life. And uh, this person said, I did not write a chapter on how to be a good grandmother because so far I have not become a grandmother. So when I become that, probably I will add one more chapter about how to be, be a good grandmother. So what I mean to say is we all go through different roles in our life. As we become older, you know, our roles expand, our responsibilities change, but relationships continue. And, uh, you know, sometimes when we talk about relationships, we only think about immediate family relationships and all those things. And a lot of things related to that. But personally in my life, what I've experienced is more than your blood relationships. And I know there will be many people who will say the opposite of what I'm going to say. And I respect them and I thank God for those experiences. But personally, I have found that a lot of times more than the blood relationships, it's the relationship which God has given in your life, which comes more beneficial. Um, I was talking to a pastor who is also a very good friend of mine. And um, he, he told me like every day he prays for me. And uh, he is not related to me in any way. He's not a blood relation or anything like that. But the only relationship we have is the fact that we are children of one father in heaven. So many times, you know, why do we pray for one another every single day and we do a lot of things? Because God has brought us into this family, which is his own household. So without forgetting that, 
Today we are going to look at some of the relationships we deal uh, in our lives. So there are three pairs as I said. Number one, it talks about husband and wife. Number two, it talks about parents and children. Number three, it talks about slave owners and slaves or masters and uh, ser servants or slaves in whichever way you want to phrase that. So first thing it mentions about wives. And what does it say? Wives... Submit to your husbands as it is fitting in the Lord. And husbands, it says, love your wife and do not be harsh with them. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter towards them. In the book of Ephesians, the command is very clear. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? Christ loved the church by dying for the church. It was a sacrificial love. The love of Christ was not a demanding love, but it was a sacrificial love. So with that, you know, we live in days where I didn't know about this term until last week. Uh, and then I read that the number of gray divorces are increasing because a very famous, rich uh, uh, family or husband and wife announced, you know, I'm not going to say the name, but you all know, announced uh, that they are going to, you know, mutually separate and all those things. So then they were telling the, the gray divorces are increasing. So it is not like young people, you know, separating, but even people above 50 separating and filing for divorces. And that trend is increasing and there are some um, statistics and there are some reasons behind that. But Bible teaches that husbands and wives, once they are married or have two people, they are married, God wants them to stay together until death separates them or Christ comes, you know, God really wants them to stay together once somebody is joined together. So the command for the wives or the, the, the thing is submit yourself to your husbands. It is fitting in the Lord. So what type of submission is this? This is not like, you know, you stand there as a master. But if a family has to work together, there, is, there needs to be love towards the wives. And uh, don't harbor bitterness. Don't be harsh with the wife. Show them the love and wives needs to be submissive so that a family can function together. And when we, when we talk about, you know, family counseling, seminars and other things, uh, we all know that the greatest need of a man is respect and the greatest need of a woman normally is love. And that's why we say love and respect is so important in a married life. If a husband cannot love the wife and if a wife cannot respect the husband, things are not going to be normal in normal scenarios. There may be some exceptions. Today there is always exceptions and people have their own ideas. But according to the Bible it says and there is enough scripture portions which tell. So I'm not going to dwell deep into this or go deeper. But as a wife, submit yourselves to your husbands. It is fitting in the Lord. And husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh or bitter towards them. If there is any husband listening to me and if you are harsh with your wife, if you are imposing things upon your wife, if you are not showing love towards your wife, the Bible teaches you, teaches us that you need to love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Be gentle with them. Otherwise, your family life will, be, will collapse. It cannot go forward. Same way, submit yourself to your husband, wives. If you are somebody who is trying to play the boss or try to do something where you feel like by your manipulation or through your tricks, you can basically make your husband do what you want to do or anything like that. That's not what God is pleased with. God wants to see a family where... There is mutual respect, love, and there is no bitterness existing in a family relationship. If you continue with bitterness, only thing you can expect is a collapse 
somewhere down the line. If you continue with hatred, bitterness type of um, thinking in your life, only thing you can expect is a final collapse. Sometimes from outside, a lot of things look very beautiful. Sometimes from outside, everything may appear very beautiful. Doesn't matter how things appear outside. What God is interested is, is in really how is your relationship with your husband, how is your relationship with your wife. You can have a mansion, you can have beautiful decorations inside, you can have a beautiful garden outside with flowers blooming and it looking very good. You can have, you know, when somebody walks into your house, you can have all the best things out there and you can give the best dinner to anybody or a best lunch possible to someone. But the question is, how is this institution of the relationship between husband and wife which God has established within a family. And if that is broken, a Christian should not ignore it. A Christian must take it seriously. Your life should not be spent with uh, that attitude. And sometimes in, we are living in times where young people doesn't have the patience. They don't have the stamina to uh, tolerate things, right? And sometimes uh, it's, it's so tough, it's so difficult to tolerate. I tell you, Unless and until both husband and wife comes under the leadership of uh, uh, and the authority of Jesus Christ, you can never be humble and submissive and you can never be loving. So married life is like a triangle and uh, husband and wife are on two sides, but on the, on the center is, should be Christ. So if Christ is at the center your life can be a blessed life. Let me also tell you one more thing. We live in a times where many young uh, people don't want to get married. And uh, there are many, many people about 30s, about uh, late 20s, 30s, and all those age, uh, you know, where they don't want to get married. And if you uh, deeply ask them, and uh, many, many have one thing to say. They say, why do we want to get into a mess? which I have seen in our own household. Girls saying, why do we want to get into a mess which my mom was for my entire life I have seen? And uh, children saying, you know, the, my, even though outside everything was good, even though we were going to the church, on, in the church my parents were very spiritual or outside world saw so everything as so beautiful, but Inside our house, it was a turmoil. It was terrible. And I'm scared and afraid that, you know, if I go in the right way and get married, my life may also be the same. I'm not making this up. This is a reality. So I want to encourage all the parents, all husbands and wives, if you have children, don't think that, you know, messing up your life is, and, uh, you know, is, is, is going to just impact you or, your family. No, it's going to have a long-term impact even on your children because they watch and they see and they learn and they form an idea. The viewpoint about the worldview about or the, the view about family and married life is not learned from books. It's not learned from other places. It is actually learned from the family in which a child is growing. So let me move on, but let me encourage husbands and wife because this is the first pair who are addressed there. So don't fight. Don't uh, show your displeasure and don't do nagging. Don't be consistently waging battle because sometimes it may feel like you, you may feel like it's all good and uh, we got together well along. Sometimes... Uh, you know, uh, husband, wife fight and kids go to sleep without seeing the resolution of that fight. And husband and wife may resolve it, but kids have never resolved. resolved. So they may feel like, you know, this is the normal part of life that, you know, husbands and wives are meant, you know, made to fight and lack of peace. And they develop a view about marriage. And sometimes they go into a marriage and when they don't see that, it becomes a problem. It was a funny thing when somebody said they got married and uh, six months and there is no fight between the husband and the wife because, you know, the, this husband is, this boy was so nice that, you know, every time there is a chance of a fight, this guy doesn't want to fight. So he will, he will do whatever best not to have a fight. 
and after six months uh, this girl says something is abnormal in our married life and this guy says what's what's abnormal everything is so good you know we didn't fight we are, we are having a good she said no we did not fight that's abnormal we did not fight and we did not go a few days without talking then realized that this girl saw that in her own family all her childhood and later years and she developed a viewpoint that if somebody is getting married they need to fight and don't talk for not talking for a few days that's normal so what what i'm trying to say is it's so serious as a christian that we are giving a right view about married life to our children let's move on the second pair is about parents and children i already gave some instruction to the parents but here it says children obey your parents in everything for this pleases the lord obey your parents in everything this pleases the lord children obey your parents not because you are you have to obey you have to obey but it also pleases the god it pleases your father in heaven that you obey your parents and then it will go well with you you will be blessed when you obey them because they have probably 25 30 35 years more experience than you in this world they may not know the latest uh, gadgets they may not know the latest technology but they know life principles they have crossed your your where you are just going to cross they have crossed teenage life they have crossed what it means to be you know studying in a college they have crossed of course their surroundings and situations were different but they have crossed they have learned life principles and when they advise you something when they tell you something when they teach you something when they teach you or tell you something obey them because it's it pleases god it pleases god sometimes you know people think i'm i'm smarter and i am more intelligent i am i know more than what my parents know yes there are many aspects in which you know more than what your parents know your parents may not know how to program your parents may not know how to create a website your parents may not know how to create a youtube channel your parents may not know how to do you know uh, certain things on the phone probably they come to you for help they may say you know this this is not working or this needs to be fixed can you fix it for me and you you fix it and you feel like you're smarter than them but when it comes to realities of life tell let me tell you your parents know more than you because they have gone through situations you have never gone yet they have lot to offer to you they have learned the word of god more than you they have lot to teach you they have experienced life they have things to tell you obey your parents for this pleases the lord simple if you're not going to obey the consequences will be there now about fathers or parents it says do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged so what does this mean word embitter means embitter means do not make them resentful do not provoke them angry make them angry poison them you know and uh, do not uh put them into a situation where they feel separated in other ways it says exasperate them provoke them do not make them very angry do not make them impatient do not annoy them greatly that's what the bible teaches fathers do not do not embitter your children but encourage them do not allow them to be, become discouraged you know there are there are styles of parenting where the key key goal is to show somebody that you did the mistake or you're not good that doesn't work there are there is a goal the goal is to correct goal is to teach goal is to bring them into the right direction so for parents we have to be careful all the parents needs to be careful that uh, we do not do things to a level where kids can get discouraged that doesn't mean that you know do everything 
do everything they ask and uh, do everything. No, having the right balance, but at the same time, making sure that you are not putting your children down. Don't say unwanted words against them. Don't call them names. Don't put titles on them which they don't deserve. Many came up from cultures where, you know, people feel very satisfied when they call people names and put titles on them, stamp them with some names, stamp them with uh, words which puts imprints into their mind which makes them to believe and think that they are good for nothing or they are not measuring up to the mark. Don't do that. Don't do that. God has created everybody uniquely. Out of three children or two children, two are not going to be same or two of your children are not going to be the same. They look different. They behave differently. They have different tastes. They have different challenges. So one person, if they becomes, uh, you know, they, they become a good tennis player, for example, doesn't mean that all your children will become good tennis players. If you are good with one thing, doesn't mean that all your children will be good with that. So, so same things. Your talent, your ability may not be the one God has given to your children. We have to recognize that. Do not compare two children. You can encourage them. You can motivate them, but do not compare and put one down. Do not put names. Do not say things in angry. You know, when you are in anger, when you are upset, don't say things which will leave a lasting imprint in their mind. As Christian parents, we have to be careful. So two sets of people. Number one, husbands and wives. Number two, children and Parents, clear instructions. If a Christian household has to move in the right direction according to the will and plan of God, the simple teachings of the Bible is, wife, submit your husband as it is fitting in the Lord and husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents for it displeases the Lord and parents or fathers do not embitter your children. Do not discourage them. Encourage them. Strengthen them. And challenge them when needed. But make sure your goal is very clear and it's correct. Don't have a different goal. Now, the third set here talks about slaves and masters. Paul was writing in a context in a, uh, from, from a time frame where they were Masters, there were slaves, there were slave owners. In fact, one of the epistles which Paul wrote, the, the book of Philemon, is entirely written to address a runaway slave who became a Christian and uh, who ran from his master, Philemon, and it is all written about that. So this was an issue which he was dealing greatly there. Now, Regarding that, today we don't have that, but still we all work. We all work and uh, we have different things. Sometimes people report to us, sometimes people work for us, and there are a lot of things. And Bible has something to tell us about how our attitude should be. So here it says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it, not only when their eyes is on you but and to, you know, carry the favor, but with sincerity of heart and Reverence for the Lord. Don't work only while being watched as, possible, as people pleasers, but whole, work wholeheartedly as pleasing and as fearing the Lord. So here Apostle Paul is addressing, I would say today, all the thieves, all the people who steal, all the people who you know, work when somebody is looking. Um, no, the different people have different work arrangements. You know, some, some people have this work arrangement where they have to do the work given to them. And it, sometimes it may take 10 hours, 20 hours, doesn't matter. If it takes 5 hours, also doesn't matter. If it takes 3 hours, it doesn't matter. But some have this arrangement where, you know, they have to really work. And um, I know all of you are hard workers, but 
Bible is very clear that our attitude towards even when we work, because just like slaves who are working for the master during those times, we all also working in different capacities. And we have to work with wholeheartedness. And we, do, we, we don't have to do anything as people pleasers. People pleasers, what they will do is they will do things to please people. But here is, is saying that don't work only while you are being watched. But work wholeheartedly fearing the Lord. Why do we need to fear the Lord? Because whatever you do, do it from your heart as something done for the Lord and not for people. Knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. Because you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. For wrongdoers will be paid back for whatever wrong he has done. And there is no favoritism. So some time ago, few years ago, we have um, studied about this whole uh, work life and faith at work and all those things during our men's fellowship and other places too. And we have spoken about it in detail about how our work is something given by the Lord. In Puritan ethics, even a cobbler thinks that when they are polishing a shoe or when they are doing something, it's work, it's worship. Not worship in the sense we do in church, but it's a form of glorifying the master because the earth when God was casting out Adam and Eve from the garden, they said, work. As if you will eat from the fruit of your labor, from the sweat, you, you know, and the, the fruit which is going to come out of that, you are going to eat. And that's the way God put this world economy in place. If you work, you will have to eat. No, not you will have to eat. You will have something to eat. If you don't work, you quit your job and sit at home. You won't have money automatically coming. Now, there are some other ways. I don't know about those things. But if you want to have things in life, a good life, anything to eat and survive and move forward, you need to work. And wherever this order has been, you know, broken, people have faced the consequences. And there will be long-term impacts on that. So, here, it's very clear the Lord is saying, if God has given you a work, see, um, the best option in our life is, let's say we have three, four offers and uh, we pick up a work, which is what we like to do. That's the best scenario. Uh, what does it mean is, uh, there, are, there are not, everybody doesn't have that privilege, right? If you ask, if I ask everybody, hey, if given a chance all over again, what you do today for your living, is that the work you would like to do? Again, you know, is this something you want to do again? Uh, and do you want a change? Let's say your pay doesn't change, your benefits doesn't change, nothing changes, and you are given an opportunity to do something else. Will you do that, right? Um, many people would say, yeah, and many people will no, 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 what I'm doing is what I love to do. This is, this is what it is. But many people don't have that. And that is where these type of issues pop up because then what happens is we don't like what we are doing or maybe we like it but we get so bored with it or whatever it may be and then we end up like doing becoming people pleasers but bible tells us don't be a people pleaser whatever you do there is a serious thing mentioned there it says whatever you do do it from your heart as something done for the lord and not for people so tomorrow when we work if we are thinking, oh, am I, I'm, I'm doing for somebody or some, some company, that's one attitude. The other attitude is, I'm doing for the Lord. Because finding purpose in your work, finding purpose in what you're doing, finding purpose. In one, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a 15 uh, seconds or 30 seconds or one hour, you should be able to tell how what you do is contributing to the society. How is it contributing to the society? If you're working in airlines industry, you know, it is taking people from one place to another. But you may not be flying, you may not, you may, you're not the pilot who's doing it, but you are doing something which enables the pilot to do it. 
You may be working you know, in a support services for a law enforcement where you are not the one who is going and rescuing people, but you are providing the back end support to people who are doing it. Similarly, everything we do will have a purpose attached to that. There may be a tie. It's not just attached to the paycheck. If you are only thinking that whatever you do is tied to your paycheck, I will tell you, your work will become a drudgery. You will not feel good about it. The mission, what are you doing and what is it bringing out? You know, people who work in the post office can actually say, you know, because of we connect our, I don't know if you have a slogan, but, you know, we connect people because uh, if, if post office didn't exist, what will we do when the COVID hit and with all these online orders and uh, other things? So what I'm trying to say is, you know, if somebody's, somebody may be working in a supply chain or something, you know, if supply chain is broken or something happens, that have, will have a huge impact. So what you do today may be insignificant in, in its own, but look at the bigger picture and then you will understand that how you are contributing to society and to the humanity in general. And if you find that you're not doing anything, pray and maybe change your job. I don't know if there is anything existing. There may be things which doesn't honor God, absolutely. But make sure. And then it says, you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. If you work everything with your heart, see, we, we hear about missionaries getting a reward. We hear about... Uh, people who give to the Lord and do a lot of services getting a reward. But here it says, what does it say? If you do it with a sincere heart, with all your heart and working for the Lord, not as human masters, then you know that you will receive a, an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. So, the work you do, Monday to Friday, That has something to do with eternity. And that is tied to your attitude. That is tied to how you do things. It is not tied to, you know, you, 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 know, you should not say, uh, by the way, if anybody wants a job, interested in a job, let me know. There is a um, uh, job fair happening here. Some, it's for the non-profit. Some, some, some uh, job fair is coming up and uh, it's paid non-profit non jobs coming up. Um, and uh, people who work there, like, you know, those fields may feel like, okay, I'm doing something which I will have an eternal, eternal reward. No. Bible tells even the slaves of those days who were just doing a household work in their master's uh, house or who were doing simple things. Bible tells that, or Paul is writing to them that you will have an inheritance from the Lord. You will have a reward if you do it with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Sometimes people can get so busy that they don't have time for the Lord. It's not talking about that either. But it says anyone who does wrong will be repaid for the wrongs and there is no favoritism. So make sure we have full integrity at our workplaces. Wherever we do work, it should be with integrity. We should not be indulged in anything where there is stealing or any of those things. Children listening to me, there are shortcuts people teach in this world, but we are not called to take shortcuts unless it's legal and ethical and it's approved morally correct. You know, but we have to be careful. And finally, it talks about the masters. Provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Master, deal with your slaves justly and fairly since you know that you too have a master in heaven. Have fairness. Have just, justice when you do things. Do what is right. You know, this plays out practically many times in our lives. You know, sometimes uh, after coming to US and we didn't have a lot of money uh, many times and, uh, and, and some, sometimes when people start their life, they don't have money, we all look for savings here and there and all those things. But, you know, there are opportunities which God gives you in your life where you can actually pay somebody more for the service they have done. They were not working for you as a slave or anything like that. But you can pay rightly. 
sometimes um, you know people negotiate 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 and uh, sometimes they will do it because they want to do it but make sure that we as christians pay what is correct don't underpay anyone under our control when i say under our control means you know if if you are in a position you are a manager or if you are people working for you make sure that everyone under you is paid what they need to be paid don't look for just profits don't just look for profits for the company or sometimes what happens is uh, people who are in a managerial position if they cut the bonuses from others they may get a bigger cut bigger bonus don't do it god will not be pleased with that give to everyone what they deserve if somebody does something good somebody comes to your house and does a work and you got a good bargain you got a good deal anything everything is good but if you feel like no this job deserves more than this go ahead and pay 5 dollars extra or 10 dollars extra because nothing is going to lose from our life but we will be honoring what god has told us provide your slaves with what is right and fair provide the workers with what is right and fair don't underpay don't underpay let not the cry of somebody who worked for you reach the father in heaven you know proverbs it says pay the wages right same way i tell you somebody comes and does a work uh and uh sometimes i don't know for some reason they may they may ask you know uh they may not ask uh, the whole money but if you feel in your heart that no this is less give them more or if you get some service something but you feel like somebody did good and if you god has blessed you and if you have the capacity ability because saving 5 dollars nothing much is going to happen in our life we will not we are not going to get much out of it but if we give if we give our farm, our master in heaven will be blessed uh, will be pleased remember god was not stingy with us god was not stingy with us he gave his son and then not only that he provided everything for us he gave us more than in many cases he provided us more than what we needed he provided us more than what we needed he provided us better than what we needed look at the cars we drive much better than the cars many cars out there look at the houses we live much better than the houses many houses out there look at the clothes we wear look at everything we own much better than many a lot of things out there so our father in heaven has given us let us be people who will give let us be people who will not have a stingy attitude or a constrained attitude because yes little little we can save but we can also bless and then we will be able to do the will of our god so wives husbands parents children and masters and slaves or the people who work if when we all operate we operate in the right way as bible teaches us you know what is going to happen we will be blessed we will be blessed and there a christian household will thrive there the supernatural blessings of god will be there there we will see relationships flourishing that's where we see relationships